Well, uh, a couple of years before I arrived at the Everett Church of the Brethren in Everett, Pennsylvania, uh, a couple with a son getting ready to go to college got up to say they had something important to say to the church. Everybody kind of paused. What could this be? Was it serious? Was there a problem? Was there a problem with the church? Uh, they were very... They were wondering because this was a couple, you know, about to enter into that uh, time of life, you know, the the son will be going off to college, they'll be looking, evaluating their lives and figuring out what lies ahead. Well, they had a surprise to share. They had a baby on the way. They would have two sons 19 years apart and beginning to start all over again just when they thought they were going to enter this different stage of life. Surprise! As it turns out, about 10 years later, uh, the, the mom was able to share with somebody else in the church because she uh, had uh, uh, almost died from her first childbirth, so, so she'd had surgery to make sure there would be no children following, and miracles happen. Surprise! Uh, 13 years later, she was about to have a child. And the, the first mom was able to say, right now it's a shock, but you're going to discover that this surprise is the best thing that ever happened to you. So, and as it turned out, it was. Uh, there are surprises in our life just when we think we have all our ducks in a row, that everything is settled in our lives, that can throw us for a loop temporarily, but which can end up being something fantastic. And that's sometimes the way the Lord works with the work of the gospel as well. Uh, in this passage here, this, this letter to the Thessalonians, you have to realize that visiting Thessalonica was not part of Paul's plans. Paul and Silas and Timothy... We're planning to visit the churches of Asia Minor, not the churches of Greece and Macedonia, the churches that they had helped to found on an earlier mission trip. This was nowhere on the itinerary. But while Paul was sleeping, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come to us. And so Paul headed to Philippi, which was in Macedonia. Now, that's not Thessalonica. That's still not on, that's still not in the plan. But in Philippi, Paul discovered that a, there was no synagogue in that city, that a group of, of women met by the river because there weren't enough men to make a quorum for a synagogue. And, and there he meets Lydia. There he meets the prayer group. And there a church is founded in her house where she runs her business. Great things happen. And Paul is so successful, he gets kicked out, which means he decides to travel further along the road. You see, Philippi was on a major east-west road. Not US 6, not even US 30. He's on I-80. And so you know that any, any stop on you know, I-80 is going to benefit from all this economic traffic that's going east and west. And that leads him to Thessalonica. In the uh, book of Acts, it says how they, uh, Paul entered into there, as was his habit, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and there Paul begins to preach. He preaches a message that's bound to create failure. What he does is he says the same thing Jesus says to the disciples on the road to Emmaus following his resurrection when they don't recognize Jesus is in their midst. He says it is in the scriptures that the Messiah, the Christ, was to suffer and to die and to rise from the dead. That's, that's not a popular message, that that part, part of the gospel is that you might just encounter opposition. 
that part of telling the truth about Jesus Christ might mean that people get pushed out of their comfort zone. That we preach a suffering Savior, not just one who rises in glory, but who suffers first. Jesus doesn't die peacefully on a deathbed surrounded by family and friends telling us that life is like a bowl of cherries and explaining things peacefully and philosophically. Jesus is betrayed and brutalized and from the agony of the cross still manages to take care that his mother will be cared for when he's gone and to share a few very brief messages with us before he is taken down from the cross and buried. The resurrection follows opposition from religious and political authorities. And this is the message that Paul preaches there. Oddly enough, it attracts people because they realize my life has been filled with suffering. My life has been filled with disappointments. I see the same path of Jesus in my life. This is my story. And so it says that many of the religious Gentiles and a great many of the women, and of course in, in that era, the men may have wore the pants in the family, but the women controlled the finances, so it mattered. A great many women who are the most important ones there, were excited and followed. The result is that those who felt that their comfortable positions were threatened, as it says in the book of Acts, in this chapter 17, hired ruffians to drag one of the new believers, one of the new believers named Jason, it says. Jason is not a Jewish name. It means that there's trouble because this new faith is mixing people from different cultures and different backgrounds and different ethnic groups. And so it's a person with a name taken right out of Greek mythology, Jason, who was dragged out in the street and beaten up. But even though Paul leaves because Paul doesn't want to be the issue, the damage has been done. People's lives have been changed. And he will write this letter to these Thessalonians saying how glad he is that despite their trials, they have found joy. Surprise! Maybe it's not the same as somebody announcing that they're about to give birth, but Paul uses the images of birth here, talking about a labor of love, using the words for labor, and using the words for love, showing that something beautiful and wonderful is coming into the world. And that we are seeing the children of God being born, being becoming a part, that he brings together faith, hope, and love in one sentence to show us that everything that is eternal is to be found in this little group in a town off the main highway of I-80, who he hadn't planned to visit, suddenly realizing that their story has been lived by Jesus and that there's nothing wrong with them, with their disappointments. God loves them, and their failures are not a sign that God is not a part of their life. Surprise, as they wait. And by the way, this is probably the first document to be written in the New Testament. This is the oldest letter of Paul's. He writes to a group who, in their suffering, waits anxiously for the return of Jesus, who is raised from the dead, who is the true God, not the false God. You see... Thessalonica was one of the first after Augustus becomes emperor to declare what they called 
the Augustan age. Caesar Augustus was declared in the Roman world to be the son of a god, the prince of peace, and the savior of the world. But Christians know somebody else has those titles and has had them through all eternity. Christians know that despite whatever beasts may utter, whatever creatures who claim to be gods, who claim to be perfect, who claim to be divinely descended, may say, we serve the true God. We serve the suffering God. We serve the redeeming God. That's why Jason was dragged out into the street. Because he was daring to say, there's something even more important than Caesar Augustus. There's something even more important than the symbols of a great empire or the symbols of a great nation. That God is greater. And that if we ever lose sight of that, we will not only lose God, but we will lose country as well. Because there is no ruler on earth who is divine. That is who Jesus Christ is. Surprise. A fellowship has been born in Thessalonica that Paul didn't plan. And it is the shining light. When Paul collects a great offering for those Christians in Jerusalem who are suffering from famine, he can count on the Macedonians, who are not rich, to give generously, even as he has to complain to richer cities like the Corinthians, who don't come through with their pledge. Surprise! From nothing comes something. There's a surprise out there, and I think sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit either. You know, if you, I didn't watch any college football yesterday. We were kind of busy with a 40th surprise birthday party for our daughter-in-law. But there were, there were stadiums. There were stadiums filled with far more people that will, than will be found in all the Brethren churches in America altogether. There are not 100,000 of us in this country. So you may say, what? Who are we? Why aren't we filling our buildings? Well, who we are are the surprise that God has for this country and for this world. This small group that wouldn't even make a good crowd. in one of the big football arenas and whose ratings are probably terrible are the originators of Heifer International which sends live impregnated animals to hungry people around the world and has done so for decades. Instead of giving them a fish, we teach them how to fish. Instead of giving them a cup of milk, we give them a cow. It started with us, and it started in this county. Church World Service, which serves people around the world, was founded by the brethren and grew as an ecumenical organization. Crop, with its crop walks across this country, was founded by the brethren. That small, tiny group. Surprise! Brethren Volunteer Service not only made a huge difference in Europe when the whole continent was in ruins following World War II, but is the direct inspiration for the Peace Corps. Because the brethren, unlike the Mennonites and the Quakers, was willing to take an actor named Don Murray who smoked and drank and said he didn't have to stop smoking and drinking. And so this actor during the Korean War 
served in Brethren volunteer service, created farms that people who were still refugees 10 years after the war were able to settle in, and then at a campaign stop when a vice presidential candidate was late and he was asked to tell stories about Hollywood, instead told stories about Brethren volunteer service, which inspired a man sitting in the audience, Hubert Humphrey, to tell John Kennedy when he was elected president four years later, this is something we've got to do. Surprise! We weren't planned. On the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, nobody's going to talk about us. They're going to talk about the big churches. That we're the child who surprised everybody by growing up and doing big things. It's not about who's not sitting in a pew. It's about the call to those of us who are here in little churches across the country who dream big and show that sometimes the child you didn't expect is the best thing that ever happened. In 1975, not only did I get married, that was one big thing in that year, but I also joined a church which accepted me and said, come on, our standards aren't that high, we can take even you. <laughs> surprise. And you're part of that surprise still. We don't have to fill a football stadium all we have to do is serve a risen Lord who suffered, who struggled, who died, who is raised from the dead. When God's spirit took Ezekiel to the valley of the dry bones, God said, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you know the answer because he was almost afraid to say the answer he knew God wanted. Well, we know the answer. Not only are these bones living, but they are passionate. We make a difference. I couldn't be happier to be serving at Union Center Church of the Brethren with you my fellow believers. And I hope you are as happy as me that we are part of a story that is so big and so wonderful and so powerful and that we haven't seen anything yet. The big things still lie ahead of us. Amen.